Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we're going to start in just a moment here after we've given everyone an opportunity to connect their sound and their video. Uh, so please just bear with us for a few moments here while we uh, invite everybody to join us. And we'll just give it another 30 seconds here. All right, well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends. I, very nice to see so many familiar faces uh, joining us this afternoon, this hot July uh, day. Um, my name is Brendan Delandria. I have the pleasure of serving the college in the role of Vice Principal of Advancement, uh, also an, an old boy of the institution, class of 2001. Uh, and today I have the honor of uh, welcoming you to this virtual event on travel and tourism in the age of COVID-19. We have some uh, phenomenal individuals joining us today for a discussion uh, about uh, this new reality and, and what to expect and, and what we've observed of recent uh, days and months. Uh, and so we hope that you enjoy today's session. This is an open uh, Zoom meeting, as you can see, so an opportunity to see some uh, fellow um, uh, community members across the college. We're very pleased to have so many current parents and parents of alumni joining, as well as uh, uh, many old boys uh, and their families as well. So uh, with that, I have the uh, pleasure of introducing our uh, moderator for today's discussion, uh, a fellow old boy of the college, Akash, Akash Pasricha, class of uh, 2013. And Akash is, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about him, uh, very notably uh, headed into, uh, into uh, a, a program in uh, journalism at Columbia University, uh, headed there this August, in fact, in about uh, 11 days. Um, Akash has written for the Globe and Mail and Financial Post magazine. He also hosts the podcast Spotlight on the Six, uh, which has been acclaimed as one of Toronto's best upcoming podcasts by Hot Docs Podcast Festival. Akash is a former Deloitte consultant, having advised uh, multinational companies in mining, insurance, retail, and financial institutions, and an honors BA from the Ivy Business School and a BSc from Queen's University, and he regularly slices his driver off the tee. Without further ado, uh, allow me to turn it over to you, Akash. Take it away, please. Thank you very much, Brendan. I appreciate that. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Akash. I'm uh, super excited to be part of this discussion, and it's really awesome to see so many familiar faces from so many different years, uh, and you know, faculty and everyone on the on the Zoom call. It's great to see you all. Uh, I'm going to introduce our two guests in just a moment, but first, a few notes about the session today. Today's session is about travel and tourism in Canada. Uh, we're going to be talking about airlines, airports, restaurants, bars, hotels, resorts. We're going to be talking about how this sector is coping in the wake of COVID-19 and what we can do to help this industry survive and hopefully thrive once again. Uh, this session is being recorded um, so that the UCC community can find it online via the UCC website uh, and certain clips after we finish, uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, as mentioned, everyone on this call is a member of the UCC community in some capacity, and so if you're comfortable, uh, we'd love to have you switch your cameras on, um, although everyone will be muted for the duration of the discussion. Uh, and finally, the way the discussion is going to work is we're going to have 30 minutes of a moderated discussion that I'm going to lead. And then starting at 2.30, thereabouts, we'll have 30 minutes uh, of an audience Q&A. And so if at any point of the discussion, even if it's before 2.30, if you have questions for our guests, uh, just pepper them into the chat and uh, we will make sure that they answer them uh, throughout the discussion. Without further ado, I want to introduce our two wonderful guests that we have with us today. Our first guest is Katie Taylor. Katie is the chair of the board of RBC and also serves as the chair of Altus Partners. He also sits on the boards of Air Canada, Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, the ADECO Group, and she has worked extensively as a member of many different boards for Sick Kids Hospital. Katie is the former president and chief executive officer of Four Seasons Hotels and Resorts, where she spent 24 years of her career, and she is a past UCC parent. Katie, thanks for being here. Thank you, Cash. Uh, our second guest is Ben Cowan Dewar. Ben is the co founder and CEO of Cabot Links, a company that owns and operates a number of world renowned golf courses in Eastern Canada. 
Ben is the chair of the board of Destination Canada, a crowd corporation responsible for marketing the country as a tourism destination abroad. Ben was also recently named to the government's Industry Strat Strategy Council to help lead, lead Canada's economic recovery from COVID-19. Uh, he is a current UCC parent, and we are all desperately hoping that his son Jack gets put into Statting's house when he joins the upper school uh, next year, uh, I believe it is. So Ben, welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, ben, I, I wanna start with you. Before we uh, start talking about COVID-19, you know, we've got people from a variety of different backgrounds on the call. And so I wanna make sure that we're defining the industry so that everyone can understand. When people think of travel and tourism, they might just think of airlines and hotels and resorts. Help us understand what kinds of businesses are part of this sector and just how significant it is for Canada. Yeah, so I think the sector in Canada represents 11% of Canadian jobs, which I think helps put in perspective just the scale of the, just the scale of it across the country. So obviously, in addition to the things you mentioned, there are a huge number of small, medium enterprises which make it up. And so it's everything from attractions to hotels, resorts, and, but also business events uh, and so on. And so I think that's part of the challenge really that we've seen is it's impacted so many facets of the Canadian economy. And it also really is something that works in every province and territory in both rural, urban and rural centers. And so I think it's wide reaching nature is partly why we felt it so acutely across the country. Right. And, and uh, you know, before or normally, you know, pre-COVID, um, how much of this industry relies on international visitors and visitors from abroad? Well, so I think, you know, the, uh, the international tourism, both 2017 um, sort of marked this watershed moment of when we'd returned to record breaking uh, revenue and, uh, and arrivals of tourists. And we broke that again in 2018 and 19. And uh, 2020 looked to be a uh, another record-breaking year as late as February of this year. And so what we would see typically at this time of year in Q3, which is the summer months when most businesses across the country, really with the exception of the ski resorts, would generate the most meaningful amount of their cash flow. We would typically see about 41, 42% of U.S. and international arrivals in this quarter. So, you know, international and U.S., and we distinguish them fairly differently because the Americans are such a huge market, really have made up all of the sort of high yield market that we've grown used to in the peak of the summer. And so with the borders shut and with, uh, with no international travel this year, you know, we have a domestic year, Destination Canada's focused on marketing it. You'd see provinces across the country marketing to their backyard. But I think we also really see, um, you know, we really see that loss of international visitors and a suppression of demand from Canadians who haven't quite returned to normal travel patterns yet. Katie, you've been in this industry for quite a few decades now. Uh, I, I want, you know, talking about COVID now explicitly, you know, how have the past few months compared to the challenges that you've seen this sector go through over the course of your career? Yes, well, you, you mentioned I spent almost 25 years at Four Seasons and that I retired seven years ago. So that dates my, uh, dates my experience considerably. Uh, it is fair to say that during the course of that career, uh, we experienced and, and lived through uh, so many different crises, uh, the kind that are of a global nature, like 9-11, the great financial crisis, uh, kind that are of a more regional nature, Asian financial crisis, uh, real estate recessions in different parts of the world. And, and then, of course, local crises, uh, whether they be hurricanes, um, uh, tsunamis, um, and, uh, and the like. Um, it's fair to say and I think Ben would agree with me that uh, the current crisis is all of those uh, and then some. Uh, we have never ever before experienced a drop in demand uh, that in some areas of the industry has been almost, uh, and in many cases for some establishments, 100%. Uh, if you take the depths of the GSC, um, which was very, very devastating for hospitality and tourism. People often think of it as a financial crisis, as a housing crisis. The hardest hit industry during the GFC was the hospitality industry, right. uh, particularly uh, centered in the United States, 
where in, in terrible situations, hotels were seeing 20, 30, 40% drops in demand. Uh, and, uh, and that was enough to send them um, into, uh, into states of, uh, of disarray and in some cases into uh, the hands of foreclosure and special services. So when you see 100% or virtually 100% drop in demand, um, you know that you have something extraordinary uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, in addition to that, Ben has, uh, has touched on the timing of the crisis. So the crisis right. arrived uh, just as spring was upon us here in Canada, heading into um, the very important summer season. Uh, many of our, uh, of our industries here in this country are small, medium-sized family enterprises that rely on, on summer for the bulk of their, uh, of their profitability, if I can call it that. Um, and so do many of our, uh, of our small towns. Think Stratford, uh, as an example, would uh, be entirely centered around the Stratford Festival. And we've, uh, some of us have followed, uh, followed that journey. And so, uh, so it's both in the nature of the pandemic as well as um, the timing of the pandemic and the, the far reaching nature of the pandemic that have made um, this particular crisis beyond anything that we have seen in modern history. And, and I think it's worth mentioning, you know, we spoke last week and you were mentioning, you know, this, this is a difficult industry to be in even when times are good, you know, with margins so thin, this is, it's a tough industry to be in even when things are going right, uh, I think is yes. what you were mentioning. Yes, that's, that's absolutely true. And, and uh, the, uh, the, the margins are thin, um, rent is high, labor cost is high, particularly in our big cities. And so uh, uh, the entrepreneurs that, that, uh, that are in this space, the businesses that are in this space really do have to be very, uh, very careful with their costs. But when you see 100% or even 80% of your revenue uh, disappear for any period of time, um, the, dent is, uh, the dent is very large and difficult to recover. Right. And Katie, what do you see as the recovery timeline for this crisis now going forward? Well, I think it's going to be uh, uh, very, um, very uh, area specific, business specific, maybe even enterprise specific. That's the, uh, the nature of the, uh, of, of the crisis. If we've seen different parts of the country open up at different times, we have parts of the country still with uh, intra-country quarantines of their own. Uh, right. The borders remain closed. So if you're a business, a local business in, in Northern Ontario that relies on, on, a lot of, uh, on a lot of local traffic, you've been in phase three for a little while, you'll have to see how, how summer unfolds. If you're a, um, a convention hotel in downtown Toronto for whom uh, large gatherings and, and cross-border travel and foreign travel was a big part of your business mix. Um, there's none of that. Uh, there's none of that coming. So it, it truly is um, a business by business um, review. But I think on on balance, uh, what we're seeing is a, a, a travel and tourism was the I call it the canary in the coal mine. It's almost always the first industry to go into distress yeah. in any economic downturn. It doesn't have to be a, a pandemic. Um, it also is often the first industry to start, start to show green shoots of recovery. Um, in this particular circumstance, um, that's all changed. Uh, travel and tourism was the first to go into the pandemic with the shutdown of, of all of those premises very quickly by uh, countries around the world and Canada was no exception. Uh, but it will be an industry that takes the longest to come out. Um, it's a little, a funny little anecdote, but I saw a survey the other day of people four categories of how you feel about going to a restaurant. Uh, the first one was, I'm fine to go. The second one was patio only. The third one was only on a special occasion. And the fourth one was never. Um, those last two, I'll only go for one special occasion and I'll never go, uh, comprised over 51% of responses. Mm -hmm. So we're sitting in a place now where people are very, um, uh, have varying levels of comfort, even though we are moving in into these different phases. And so I think we'll see this industry be very slow to recover. And if you're following right. at all, uh, you know, the pronouncements of large, uh, the large um, hotel companies, the large airline companies, those CEOs are calling for three to five year recovery, depending on what their uh, particular business mix looks like. Right. Ben, I, I want to turn to you because so much of, of you know, you do work across the country, but a lot of your business is out east. Uh, and, you know, the, the concept of the Atlantic bubble kind of gives you an interesting perspective on, uh, you know, A, 
how things could get back to normal, but also how a bubble, you know, economically affects a region. I mean, talk about the Atlantic bubble. What is your perspective right now on how things are going with all that? Uh, yeah, so the Atlantic bubble, for those who don't know, was the four Atlantic provinces decided to bubble with each other and anybody from outside of those four provinces still has to quarantine for 14 days when they arrive. And, and in, so that's unique in Canada. I mean, we could have flown at any point from Toronto to BC and, uh, and gone on vacation in the last few months. And so it's really been a unique thing in the Maritimes. And, you know, it was really driven by popular sentiment. And I think... Uh, Katie's restaurant survey was not done in uh, in Newfoundland where folks are still hiding under their beds I think but uh, <laughs> there's there's a real degree of fear in the Maritimes and there's also a challenge that there are zero cases for many days in a row so the idea of opening to the rest of Canada uh, seems even even scarier I'd say practically as a uh, as an idea it hasn't worked and um, you know the Maritimes have a very small population extremely reliant on American and international visitors to make up um, the higher yield. So it's not just the number of bodies, which is crucial that we would typically get from outside, but it's also just a much higher yield customer. So in our own business, you know, the Maritimes would make up about 11% of our typical year. Uh, so to try and take that market and say you're going to spread it across Q3, uh, really isn't enough even to keep oil in the machine. So I think there's awareness of that, certainly in Nova Scotia. And uh, the premier announced last Friday he would move out of the uh, out of the Atlantic bubble imminently, and, and that would mean welcoming all Canadians. But, I mean, I think that's a first step, but we're still a long way away from reopening the U.S. border while it uh, while we, we sort of push it out 30 days every 30 days, I think you know, we're many months from that and uh, and we don't have a path to open the international borders uh, either. And so, I mean, I think, you know, at the beginning of this in March, we were talking about three years to recover and I think three years seems optimistic now. And, uh, you know, IATA, the airline said 2024, um, right. you know, this week. And so I think, um, you know, I think we're really, uh, as Katie said, it was hit first, it was hit the hardest, and uh, and it'll actually be the slowest to recover. Although, you know, there are similarities, and, and it's really a, an unbelievable uh, event for obvious reasons, public health uh, first. But, you know, I think when you look at the, the challenges tourism's faced, retail is right behind us. So Q3 for the tourism sector is Q4 for the retail sector. And again, right. you're talking about massive employers in this country um, who are really facing an unbelievably uh, bleak period of time over the next six to nine months. Um, and that's to get us to next year, which nobody's thinking will be that much better. So I think, you know, and those trends really we're seeing globally too. They're, they're true across the country, um, but they're very, you know, very true everywhere else in the hospitality and tourism sector too. Right. And Ben, you touched on, I mean, I, I was going to ask you what your outlook is for, you know, this being uh, peak season in Q3, you know, I was going to ask what your outlook is for the winter. I mean, uh, the winter, I guess it's, it's bringing, there, there's not a lot of uh, great things on the horizon for the winter months, I guess, when this is significantly reduced as well, you were saying. Yeah, well, I mean, I think Katie touched on it too. It really depends, right? So the resorts in Ontario outside of Toronto are actually having really strong demand. So as people can't travel to Europe or the U.S., and they're staying home. So that's true in, uh, you know, it's true in Alberta where the Rockies, the hotels in the Rockies are doing, you know, 65% because, again, the market is big enough in the Alberta market, but it's at a much lower yield. So I think while... You know, those those are examples of keeping oil in the machine. They're not, even when you hear 65%, it's at a much lower spend per head than they would be getting from their guests from Texas or, uh, or Germany. So I think as we look into, you know, the winter, there's sort of two, two parts of it. One is a confidence of when will people return. So, uh, you know, the going to restaurants is one, the getting on a plane is another and although you know there's lots of studies and and even we've seen press this week about how planes are unbelievably safe places it's a hurdle that we need to get people over we need to get people moving around again and and so i think you know winter will largely depend on um you know on where we are from a public health standpoint but winter aside from the ski resorts is typically not a season that we are 
uh, you know, we're looking to fill the cash registers. So, um, you know, I think the outlook really is more trying to look ahead to 2021 at this point uh, and feel where we'll be for that. Katie, you, you come from a marketing background. I'm curious, you know, you, Ben was talking about the messaging and trying to, you know, instill trust back in, in customers and consumers. Uh, with your marketing hat on, I mean, uh, how do you think about this issue in terms of instilling confidence back into customers? How do you do it? Well, it's, it's, it's very difficult, uh, right? We, we went to great pains, uh, and rightly so, to convince people that they really needed to stay home and stay hunkered down and shelter in place and, and only go out for absolute necessities. And we did such a great job on that, um, that unwinding that even in the face of, of new science and new reality uh, is, going to be, uh, is going to be quite difficult. Uh, you know, if you think about my restaurant example, so we have rules in place on physical distancing. Uh, for those of you who've been to a patio, you can see that the servers, the training, the protocols, um, at least to the ones I've been, uh, I've been frequenting, have been very, very good. Uh, yet I have friends and, uh, and colleagues who say, oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm not doing that. That's, uh, that's just a bridge too far. And so, so I do think their, their time is part of this as people start right. to understand that, uh, uh, we're going to be living with this for some time to come, and we need to adjust our behaviors uh, and our own uh, our own personal sense of responsibility around mm -hmm. how we can uh, we can responsibly go to restaurants, patios, how we can responsibly um, be uh, be out in uh, in public and enjoying um, this great country and all it has to offer. Uh, right. Whether that's you know hotels have been operating through the pandemic. Uh, I like to point out to people, um, some have closed because there was no business, right? But a lot of them have been operating through the pandemic and many of them have been operating through the pandemic in support of our frontline medical workers. So it's fair to say that just like grocery stores, and in fact, yeah. I might argue um, even, even more so, hotel companies and, and individual hotels have learned really well how to um, maintain uh, the, the safety protocols, the cleaning protocols, the distancing protocols. Um, they've been operating this way for months and months and months. Um, and so when you think about venturing out to, uh, to, to, to take a stay, know that they've been thinking through all of the, uh, the special needs of your stay to make sure that it's as safe as it can, uh, can possibly be. Um, and in, in many respects, um, you know, the, uh, I always say to people, if you're going to the grocery store, then there's a whole bunch of other places you should feel very safe going because, um, right. in some cases, uh, these, uh, these venues and travel and tourism are doing even more, um, around right. safety right. protocols than you might, uh, than you might experience in other places. And, and I, I love that anecdote of hotels, housing frontline workers, because, you know, we don't hear too much about that, but, you know, even hearing that now, it. It, it makes sense to me that, you know, that, that, uh, that uh, you know, they are well equipped uh, to handle guests. And so I think and that makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. And they're, 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 they're clean care protocols and they all have a different phrase that they use to describe it has been very informed by scientific experts and, uh, and, uh, and experts in industrial cleanliness to, uh, to help them uh, navigate this as, as they've gone along. Right. I, uh, I, I was, I see Brendan has just put a, uh, a reminder, and so I was just going to say it live as well. Um, please, as we're going along, if you have questions, uh, audience members, just feel free to pepper them in, and we will get them in uh, as soon as possible. The floor is open, uh, so please um, have at it. Um, while we're waiting on audience questions, I want to ask you both about uh, government uh, intervention and government support. Uh, ben, you talked about you know some of the um, the region specific, the Atlantic bubble sort of uh, legislation and stuff like that. I mean, if we, if we open it up more broadly to think about federal government support and even provincial support, what's worked and what hasn't for you? Well, I think, you know, so I chaired Destination Canada, which, you know, in a normal year would market Canada as a tourism destination, and we would focus on 11 international markets primarily. I think we launched a new strategy for the country's tourism about 18 months ago. And one of the things we really said in that is, 
um, you know, while our most lucrative clients come from international markets, the Canadian market is by far the biggest market. And so we had really focused our energy on marketing Canada to Canadians as low hanging fruit and particularly trying to capture some of that uh, leakage that we would see from the higher yield Canadian travelers going to, you know, Europe or the US in the summertime or uh, or warm destinations throughout the winter. And so I think we had already pivoted there about 18 months ago. And back in uh, February, we actually stopped marketing internationally and aligned all of our marketing to market uh, Canada to Canadians, which uh, really has been the only market uh, this year. And I think the provinces uh, that I would say have done the best job have done the same thing. They've realized that... Uh, you know that that was going to be the market they got there early and uh, and i think um you know a lot of the things that kd referred to and sort of how do you restore confidence i think it's incumbent on those in the industry to restore confidence in their customers so there's no one who's more incentivized whether it's airlines or hotels and making sure they're doing everything they can so that they can say to their guests you know we're ready to welcome you back and and I think we're seeing, you know, we're seeing positive response from that. And, you know, as I said, it doesn't replace the spend or the sheer volume uh, that we really need to have the industry remain sustainable and vibrant. But uh, I think that's where we've seen the most success and uh, that we can point to at this point in the year. Katie, when, when we spoke last week, you, you had mentioned, you know, the idea that the government was uh, you know, in some ways taking an approach where every industry was equal and so trying to apply measures that would uh, save most industries at once. Uh, you know, you had mentioned that the travel and tourism industry really is uh, unique in many ways. But what, what do you think has worked about the government response and what would you have, what, what do you hope for going forward? Well, I think the, um, you know, the government's, uh, uh, government's quick response to provide income support and, uh, and special loans and services to uh, to business and individuals to make sure that the uh, the, con the consumer piece of the economy and the small business piece of the economy um, was able to uh, was able to maintain itself over the last uh, last couple of months. Obviously, very uh, very welcome to all. But as the pandemic um, drags on and drag on, it will um, and the impact of, uh, to travel and tourism um, it as we've discussed, is going to be a long ranging one. Um, I think uh, one of the things that we're going to have to come to grips with is that different parts of the economy are going to recover very differently. Mm. Uh, and where certain parts of the economy might be seeing, um, you know, some reasonable expectation of, of growth over the course of the balance of, of this year, um, certain other parts, and I would put travel and tourism here, um, that that will be much less robust. Um, part of it will be uh, the fear factor. Part of it is the uh, uh, travel restrictions. Um, part of it is um, just the fact that we're moving into uh, the fourth quarter in the winter months in Canada, where, as Ben pointed out, other than uh, other than ski resorts, which are few and far between, um, travel and tourism activity is just much lower. And so, by definition, we're going to see um, a continued high level of unemployment um, for people who make this their, their primary workplace. Um, we're going to see, I fear, um, a, a rising level of business bankruptcy in this segment. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, this is a, um, an industry that is, we think about big names when we think about it, right? We think about Air Canada, we think about Four Seasons, we think about Marriott um, and, and big restaurant chains. But uh, uh, the vast majority of this uh, of this industry is made up of small and, and medium sized enterprises for whom uh, working capital is in scarce supply. And so trying to hold on, if you will, um, as as they chase down um, uh, business through the summer and then try to stay afloat essentially to the next big season, uh, which for many of them will happen next year, um, will be a very, very difficult, uh, difficult um, uh, task. And so I do think that as we move deeper into um, this, uh, this crisis, um, travel and tourism will call out for, for some, uh, some, special, uh, some special attention, um, uh, but as I said, both because of uh, business uh, sustainability, but also just because uh, the levels of unemployment will remain extremely high.
Right. And, and do you have, a, to, to, to either of you, I mean, do you have any um, ideas that, that, you know, you've, in, in your networks or stuff like that, you know, ideas around, uh, creative ideas around innovation or what the government could do to help spur uh, domestic tourism or help the, the industry specifically um, be getting a little more specific? Well, Ben's done a lot of work in this area, so I'm going to leave the uh, the detail to him. But I think you know, on on two fronts, Ben's already mentioned um, the awareness and and just getting getting people focused more on the art of the possible in travel and tourism, as opposed to all the things you ought not to be doing. Um, and so, right. I think as we move into very low uh, COVID transmission numbers, um, and assuming we can keep them there with very responsible personal and uh, and and group behavior uh, then there should be a lot of opportunity for Canadians um, to get back out into their uh, into their locales and start to support um, a local business and I think that'll that'll be a that'll be a big part of it the other part um, uh, which relates to keeping our uh, you know keeping these businesses going is is and, and Ben you can speak to this more specifically but the need for long-term uh, um, low low rate financing so that that these businesses can see their way through not only a couple of months of COVID but for many of them this is going to be a multi year journey and so how do we how do we help them um, through that yeah so I think building on that I think um, you know really rebuilding confidence is the first step and. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, trying to find some demand. And we've had, uh, you know, we've had some great support. Peter Mansbridge on Canada Day did a, did a video sort of talking about the importance of the sector. And uh, he actually shot it from his backyard in Stratford for us. And, you know, I think as people are aware of how much these things are really a part of the fabric of their community and that supporting them. And we sort of got that with restaurants, I think a little bit, earlier on of, you know, supporting through takeout and so on. And as Ontario moves into stage three and, uh, and it's okay to venture out, I think that's the first and biggest thing we can do because we need to restore some of the demand. I think, uh, you know, promoting that, promoting that across the country uh, is really key. And it's more than just advertising. It's really a change of tone and, right. and what we're allowed to do. So I think that's the biggest. I think the you know, the piece about taking a non-sectoral response to it is really the Department of Finance's de facto response to every economic crisis. And I think, as Katie said, I mean, this has not been a crisis that has hit agriculture in this country hard uh, or technology. Both sectors are actually up, but certainly the retail and tourism hospitality are really acutely impacted and we think will be for some time. So I think, you know, it's a really take a long-term view that can be certainly with long-term uh, financing, you know, we're not able to replace revenue. The number would be so massive. So what can we do? And I think the other place is really to look at how we can reopen the borders and how we can do that safely. And what are the things that are needed to do that? Because I think the sooner that there is, you know, the conversation is had that the economy and the, you know, the country's economy needs to be held in a similar regard to public health. And we need to not have a conversation where it's one at the expense of the other, but that these are going to be two. Because I think all of the projections suggest we're living with this for 22 to 24 months. So if that's the case, you know, we need both a, way to work our way out of it and a way to, you know, be there in the long term. This was a sector that was actually one of the ones that we really felt like Canada can and should compete globally and win. And it's one that we have historically won in. So it isn't, you know, it, it's sort of while over 90% of the businesses are SMEs, it makes it a bit harder for folks to get their head around what are the big brand names um, that do it. But when you think about a sector that creates 11% of employment, yeah. you know, more get everybody knows it from coast, coast, coast. Okay. I, I want to turn to the, to a few audience questions that we have. Um, Doug Blakey, former headmaster for UCC, he asks in the chat, uh, if the borders are closed to the U S and for international travel, how much do Canadians have to step up in order for our travel and tourism industry to survive 
what sort of percentage increase would we need to see? Ben, you're smiling. I wonder if you if you have an answer that jumps out. Well, they need to step up uh, probably more than we can. So I think uh, everything they can and more is probably the easy answer. But in terms of you know travelers, eighty percent of the the travel is domestic in the country. So eighty percent of the people moving around are Canadians moving around Canada. So you would so. But when you then think about what that twenty percent drive in terms of yield, um, it's so significantly uh, you know more than the percentage of visitation that you know we we probably um, you know we're probably going to lose close to a third, thirty three percent of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and and again, it's just the habits are so different. So there is a there's certainly a market, and I would say within the UCC family, there's probably folks that could identify that you know maybe. Uh, maybe a European vacation or going to Nantucket or the Hamptons were things that people did in the summertime. So keeping that customer in Canada does go a long way if they spend their dollars in Canada. Um, and that is meaningful. But, you know, the reality is, I think if every Canadian stood up and did their part, um, you know, we'd, uh, we'd be really doing the best we could to keep oil in the machine, but I don't think we'd be able to fully replace it. Right. Uh, I want to stay on the audience questions here. Uh, Katie, maybe I'll go to you. Uh, Linda Fan asks uh, a number of questions. The first question, you know, I'm not sure if you can say on answer this within reason, but the question is, is it safe to travel now? If we go to travel in addition to the normal preparation work, what matters do we need to pay attention to? Uh, I think, you know, you were talking about this a little bit with the, uh, with, the uh, with all the precautions that uh, hotels and stuff are taking. Uh, what's, your, what's your perspective on this? So, so I think it is safe to travel. Um, I personally am uh, and very comfortable traveling. At the moment, I can't travel because traveling outside Canada means I have to come back and go into quarantine uh, when I get here, which means it makes it quite impractical for me to, uh, to, uh, to attend to uh, some of my international business needs, um, it, including countries that are having much lower COVID rates um, even at the moment than Canada is. And so um, I think Ben alluded to this earlier that there are, there are lots of places in the world um, that have uh, that have figured this out that have opened their corridor to Canada, but we've kept ours um, closed to them. Uh, and uh, and in the same way as those same countries that let Canada in did not let the United States um, into that uh, into that green corridor. So I think that we we as a country um, can say that it is is safe to travel. Canadians have been traveling. Right. Right. They've been flying back and forth across this country um, as they needed to for business and family reasons um, throughout the pandemic. Uh, and if you talk to the ones who have, they will tell you. Um, I think that they have felt, uh, felt pretty good about the experience they've had in our airports um, where there's been all kinds of changes made uh, to ensure the safety and security of passengers moving through. Not, not quite frankly, very different than the, uh, the accommodations we all had to make after 9-11 um, and the security issues that we had to uh, deal with there. Um, if you pay, pay any attention to what's happening with the big global airlines, you'll see that all of them have very, very intense uh, clean care programs in place, uh, personal protective equipment for, for staff, um, uh, special clean care kits on the plane, to help people feel uh, feel good about uh, about their their travel, and then of course if if you're if you're uh, transporting yourself from an airport to a hotel, uh, if you've been in an Uber, it's it's kind of the same. You know, you wear your mask, they wear yours, but they're cleaning their they're cleaning their cars more often and, and doing all the things that that we would expect um, them to do. And then you know once you um, get to your destination, and whether that's a hotel or or some kind of a uh, a vacation rental. Um, you can do a lot of work in advance as a traveler to make sure that the place you are going um, has the standards in place um, that you'd like to see for, for, for cleaning. And lots of places are also providing uh, additional cleaning, uh, um, whether it's hand sanitizer or wipes in a hotel room, so that even if you think um, that the person who did the room before you wasn't uh, cleaning the room for you, um, didn't do the perfect job, you have a chance to, uh, to take care of that yourself. But again, I think that all of those, uh, if we segment all of these things down to, you know, are we keeping physical distance? Are we um, wearing uh, protective face covering? Are we washing our hands all the time? All the basic simple things apply to travel too. 
Um, and uh, I think if you're uh, if you're if you're if you have the mind to to be careful and 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 honestly uh, choose suppliers that are being careful too, um, I think travel uh, to certain destinations in the world today is is quite safe. Right. I uh, we've got a, a couple questions here um, about uh, about students uh, and you know this being the ECC community, I think you know it would be great to touch on students. We've got a question here. Uh, can you speak to the outlook for students who are strategizing to enter the hospitality lodging industry as entrepreneurs since there is a three to five year recovery, financing is tight, but this contraction could also be fertile for entering the industry? Love this question. We'd love to get both of your thoughts on it. Ben, let's start with you. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, I think it is. Um, so we have... Uh, you know, we have a development that's under construction in the Caribbean right now, which is, uh, will be finished in Q4 of 22. And we actually love that timing. And I think the demand for uh, real estate there in sort of farther, uh, farther flung beautiful places is actually, we've seen a real spike in real estate interest in both Nova Scotia and there. And I think it's probably, and Katie and I have talked lots about this, but I think it's probably one of the great buying opportunities in the sector. Um, I don't know that it's right now, but I think uh, it's, you know, it's certainly in the cycle. And so I, th I think it is great. I mean, I think, you know, the reality is at some point, um, and in that three to five year window, we'll hope that's closer to three, um, you know, people will return to, uh, people will return to travel. They will return to it. And I think it's me like where we've seen trips starting to happen again, are families who haven't seen each other. And uh, I think just the reality of that close friends and, and how important it is. And what are the things that the pandemics taught us are so important to both, you know, family, close knit friends experiences. I mean, I think, you know, it's a sector that had seen extraordinarily global, global growth in the last decade. And, uh, and so I think we will get back to it. So I think it is absolutely fertile time and, uh, and a great time. You know, I think there's a lot on the technology, but I think, um, you know, there's, there's a fair amount just on the real asset side of it too, that's going to be interesting. Katie, I'll turn to you as well. For entrepreneurs who are, who are looking, who were looking to get into this industry and, and might still be looking, uh, what's your advice for those entrepreneurs right now? Well, I, I would agree with Ben. I think that, you know, out of all of these, uh, these situations comes opportunity. And I have been a big uh, fan of this industry my whole career, obviously, um, and have spoken uh, endlessly to young people about, uh, about the advantages of, of the hospitality industry. Um, a lot of people say to me, oh, you know, my job isn't very much fun. And I always say to young people, well, if you want to be, have a job that's fun, then you have to work in a, in a business or in an industry whose product is fun. Um, and the hospitality industry and the hotel business and, and all of the ones that, that are associated with that, um, these are industries that are primarily at their heart in the business of producing happiness for people. Um, and so by definition, I think it's a great uh, industry. It's also an industry where as a young person, you get to learn every single vertical of business, right? It doesn't matter whether uh, you're running a restaurant or you're running a hotel or you're running a, um, an airport or an airline. You are in the marketing business. You are in the accounting business. You are in the financing business. You are in the, in the, uh, the customer service business. You're, you're in the retail business. Like every element of business finds itself into the, all the microcosms find themselves built into um, the hospitality, uh, the hospitality uh, and tourism sector broadly defined. So as a business experience, um, there is almost nothing that is, is more encompassing. So I would say to these young entrepreneurs, find your spot, um, get going. Um, there will be some wonderful opportunities and the experience that you'll have will be fantastic. Ben, we've got uh, two questions here about uh, specifically, you know, uh, the border with the U.S. Uh, one person uh, talking about you know, expecting uh, groups coming from the U.S. to PEI that were postponed this year. Uh, and then another, another uh, person asking about what kind of metrics uh, we might need to establish as to when Canada will feel comfortable allowing Americans into the country. What's, what's your gut feel on this around when uh, Canada might look to open things up with America? And I guess I might follow up with, I mean, is it really in Canada's control? America is playing their own game right now, right? I mean, is it, is it 
uh, what, what would you be looking for? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, my personal opinion is the border will reopen when there's constituencies on both sides of the border that want the border to open, which there isn't today. Um, and so, you know, if you look province by province, premier by premier, there literally is no one um, that's advocating for the U.S. border to reopen. So you don't really have that groundswell. So when do you have that groundswell? You have that groundswell in November and December when snowbirds are staring down uh, winter in, uh, in Canada and governors in southern states who are so reliant on the million Canadians who migrate south um, would have real economic hardships if not. So I think that'll be the first time and that'll be the real test. I don't think until then we'll see a real test because it's, you know, it's a solution that neither country um, is looking to solve today, in my opinion. Uh, I think the, the bigger challenge is how do we reopen and under what uh, circumstances? And I think that is the piece that, you know, to the question on international travel, I think we all really need to solve. And I think countries around the, the world are all solving this in very different strategies. But, you know, not everybody has an answer. I mean, you see Heathrow Airport talking to the UK government about how to do it. Korea has a rapid test. Um, you know, so I think some of that's going to need to be solved to really open up the international borders. And I think there will be, you know, it'll be a challenge for with, you know, Germany, Japan, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, I think given our relationship with the U.S., that'll be really tricky. So until we solve for that, it's going to be very difficult to imagine reopening the borders. All right. Um... Ben, I, I just want to stay on this because, you know, you were saying October, November. I, I, I love that point about having constituencies on both sides. I think that's important. I think, you know, one thing that um, that we haven't seen also is, like you said, the, the winter seasonality. People are expecting things to get significantly uh, worse, perhaps, uh, you know, staying inside. But um, I love the point about, you know, there being desire for more travel for people to, you know, those snowbirds and stuff like that. And so it might actually bring opportunities in that way in the way that we might not. Back. Yeah, and I mean, I think that the reality is, look, I, you know, we've seen epidemiologists who talk about the second wave in the winter, and we've seen an equal number who say, you know, there's nothing that suggests that. You also see, you know, people who are rightly concerned about what's happening in Florida to whether they'll return to Florida this winter. So, I mean, I think this really is in the time will tell category. But what I would say is right now, there is not a province that is advocating to open the border. And absent you know that it's very difficult to imagine um you know any politician going out and you know to do it i mean back to our uh, you know back to our earlier discussion it's hard for the atlantic premiers to get consensus among their you know their constituents to open to the rest of canada so i i think this really is something that's going to take some time but i hope that you know as the science and as the testing becomes there even i think it'll be harder for the political leaders um, to come out of it. But I think they're going to need to show some real courage and some real leadership because we do, from both a business and from a tourism standpoint, need to figure out a way out of this corner. Katie, we, uh, we've got about nine minutes left here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to work through these last few uh, audience questions. Um, Katie, I, I might um, soft lob this question to you from a familiar uh, old boy. I think you'll see the chat. Uh, Taylor Harris asks, what learning lessons can we take from the pandemic thus far and reopening in the event of a second wave if it hits Canada or parts of Canada? Is a full lockdown the only answer or can we expect Canadians to endure this again in the event of another spike? Yeah, well, thanks, Taylor. That's my son for anybody who, uh, who doesn't connect the, the, the last name. Um, I think the, um, you know, we're, 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 we're learning these lessons real time, right, as we watch the rest of the world. Um, and so if you, if you think about the, the travel bubble that the, uh, that the European Union formed and then the UK um, jumped into later, um, that bubble included Spain. Um, and this week, Spain has regressed and has had a, a new outbreak. And now the UK has said, no, no, Spain, you now have to be back on, on the quarantine list. So I think that that where we, where we started with the pandemic, which was, look, everybody has to do exactly the same thing across the entire world um, to suppress, um, to flatten the curve, um, then turned into, 
kind of a, an idea that maybe we could eliminate the virus if we got the curve low enough. I think we're learning as we go um, that the virus is not going to be eliminated. It's going to continue to circulate in some fashion, um, however it chooses uh, to do that. But I think we also know that we can keep that curve flat um, if, we, uh, if we have certain uh, behaviors in place. And so I think as we navigate this, and it's a little bit back to the, the story I told on why I think travel is safe, is that so much of, of this lies in the hands of us as, as individuals uh, to take responsibility for our own behaviors and the behaviors of those around us. Um, and if we all do things until such time as the virus is gone or we figured out um, how to inoculate ourselves against it or how to treat people who, who, who get it better. Um, you know, the, the, there, will be a, there will be a need for what I would consider quite bespoke solutions and quite regional solutions. And some of them might even be, be parts of like we're seeing today in Ontario. Part of Ontario remains in stage two while all the rest of Ontario is in stage three. Um, when everybody in Ontario is stage three, there might be a part that goes back into stage two. We'll just mm, have to right. see how the virus behaves. And so I think the, hopefully we can avoid the full um, lockdown. I mean, if you think about, leave, leave aside the economic consequences of the lockdown for a second, which were, were devastating to, uh, to the country and the country's finances. Um, but if you just think about the emotional and, and mental health toll, uh, that this has been taking on people to think about doing that again. Um, you, you know, you'd have to, you'd have to, I think, utilize other tools first before we want to put people through that again. And hopefully we've learned enough about the effectiveness of, uh, of social distance or physical distancing, hand washing and, and, uh, and face covering that we can, we can utilize some of these, uh, these other other ways of working um, to keep the virus under under control, but it's going to take. Uh, you know, I think it will be case by case, and uh, but hopefully the uh, the, the wholesale um, uh, one size fits all um, won't. Hopefully, that won't have to be a, a a solution in the future. Right. We've got time for I think one more audience uh, question, and we'll probably look to wrap it up. Um, ben, very quickly for you, uh, somebody brought up uh, the travel insurance industry and how that industry is responding. Talk about that a bit. Well, I think, you know, I mean, it's interesting. I was thinking as Katie was talking about, um, and I know the questions from a consumer travel insurance, but when Katie was talking about hurricanes or tsunamis, I mean, one of the things about this is insurance really didn't exist for the sector. So when I first saw the question, I sort of thought that was, uh, that's the other interesting part of it is it's one of those rare, rare occurrences where a hurricane has taken demand to zero, closed hotels, but insurance didn't work. And I think, Travel insurance reacted the same way. So if you were in the business and you had insurance, your insurance provider said, aside from Wimbledon, who had been paying for uh, pandemic insurance for 37 years, uh, the rest of us were out in the cold. I think travel insurance responded very similarly. And they have you know, waded back into the water, I think, again, just basically to try and have some consumer, you know, some consumer confidence building back up to be able to go again. And, uh, and we've seen that this week where there's been a response saying they would uh, they would cover COVID. Um, so, I, I mean, I think, you know, that's a new normal, too. It was a full absolutely no back in March. It's now a uh, allowances for it. And, uh, and I think we'll see that evolution. And again, if we you know, if we take the view, which I do, that we'll be living with this for some time, I think it's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be all sorts of these solutions, many that Katie just mentioned, and coming up with better testing and tracing. And I think we've learned a lot about the virus we didn't know back in March, and certainly where we see, you know, the spreading events happen in close-knit places, whether it's bars or gyms or health clubs. I mean, these are bigger, these are bigger challenges. You know, th those businesses are going to take longer and they're going to be slower to recover. And, uh, but I think, you know, we, we can recover, we can move about. And, uh, and I would say uh, I'm, at a, uh, I'm at a resort in Ontario, so it is safe to travel and I'm here with my family. So there you go. There you go. Uh, Katie, very quickly, I, I want to make sure we're ending on, on you know, uh, a bit of a positive note, if there is one. I mean, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of um, great insights, you know, some bleak, but also some opportunities here. Uh, where do you see hope for this industry? How can we, uh, as Canadians, really ensure that we're helping this industry as much as we can going forward? 
So I think there's plenty of hope for, uh, for the industry. I mean, if you think about the, uh, the human, uh, human condition, we are by definition uh, um, pack animals, right? We like to be together. Um, it's part of how we, how we live, how we learn, how we enjoy, how we develop. Um, and uh, you know, when the, uh, when the internet was first invented, uh, my team used to say to me, and, and teleconferencing, my team used to say to me, oh my God, like nobody will come anymore. Well, that was absolutely wrong. People came in larger numbers and, and, uh, and uh, in, uh, in greater frequency because of the social element of what it is we offer, the business collaboration element, the learning element, um, if it's a business meeting. And so I think the outlook is very bright. Um, the fact that we're all talking about how much we miss all the things that this industry offers um, is evidence to me of the fact that there's always going to be a large, large demand um, for, uh, for the services that uh, hospitality and tourism offer. Um, and uh, once we get the, the essence of how to control this pandemic, um, you know, under our belt, so to speak, and, and we're actually effective in, in managing through it, um, we'll be even more ready for anything else that, uh, that comes our way. And I think that the, uh, the industry will be there. And you can see when you go back to these uh, establishments, they're, they're there. They're so happy to see you. Um, and in fact, right. you're so happy to see them too. So I think... Uh, the future is bright. Buy sunglasses. <laughs> awesome. I will, uh, we'll end it there. Brendan, I'm going to hang it, hand it back to you. Thank you so much to both of you for, uh, for all of your insights. It's been a tremendous discussion. And, and, uh, and uh, I think we, we, as Katie said, we have uh, some things to look forward to. So, so thank you very much, both of you. Thank you very much, Akash, uh, for facilitating a really thoughtful uh, and expert discussion today. Uh, much appreciated. As, uh, as I think we've heard today, uh, travel, tourism, and hospitality are integral in so many ways to our community, to our economy, uh, and today's discussion has really thoughtfully explored many different sides of how COVID-19 has disrupted that, has changed that, but is maybe also propelling us um, in innovative ways toward the, the bright future that, that Katie described. So on that note, I want to thank uh, you both, Ben and Katie, very much for taking the time today from uh, your locations um, to share the depth of your thinking, your expertise, and, uh, and really your commitment to, uh, to exploring this issue. Uh, as a very small token of our thanks, uh, the college has made a, a donation uh, to the Sick Kids Foundation uh, as a gesture of thanks and on your behalf. Uh, so thank you both very, very much. Uh, to all of the old boys, parents, and past and present, and colleagues who have attended today, thank you for joining us for this special event. Uh, if you enjoyed today's session, we hope you'll join us again for our next one, which we'll be announcing soon uh, on the uh, matters of financial response to COVID-19. Uh, and so, you know, with that, I just want to note that, you know, it, it's a real testament to our community, the creativity, the, the curiosity, uh, and the engagement of the UCC community on a wide range of issues. And it's, and it's really our pleasure within Advancement and on behalf of the college to be able to bring these types of events to you uh, to showcase the incredible thought power and leadership that exists within the UCC community. So we hope you'll join us again soon. Uh, and on a final note of thanks, I'd just like to thank the team who made today's event uh, possible behind the scenes, uh, Leanne. Gardner, Samantha Kerbel, and uh, Christina Schreiber. Uh, thank you all very, very much. Uh, ben and Katie, the last word is yours. Well, I'll just say thanks everybody for being here and thanks for being so interested in this uh, in this fantastic industry. We appreciate uh, we appreciate that the uh, that you've taken the time to share with us, and we also hope that you will take the opportunity to get out there and spend a lot of money at your local establishments. I think we could leave that as the last word. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you very much, guys. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Thank all. you.